Today we're going to close out metabolism, our multi-class journey on metabolic pathways by bringing the different catabolic and anabolic paths that we've introduced so far in the setting of diets and obesity, alcohol consumption and metabolism, as well as oxidative stress. And we'll do this introduction through diets over the ages. The first one that we will start off with a couple of decades ago is the low-fat diet. So, oh, if an individual wants to re reduce their BMI, reduce their adiposity, reduce their fat stores, it seemed like it would make sense to reduce fat intake, eliminate fat intake, and then maybe just open and gain fat. However, from the pathways that we've talked about the last couple of classes, one can see how if there's an excess of the building blocks for triglycerides, the circulating fatty acids with that carbon backbone, all of these pathways can run in reverse for fat storage instead of fat breakdown. If the fat intake is substituted with an equal amount of carbon sources, all right, caloric intake, through complex carbohydrates that get broken down into simple sugars or simple carbohydrates, glucose, sucrose, etc. That's all you need to make fat. Why? Well, the glycerol backbone for triglycerides can be bypassed out from glyceraldehyde free phosphate, be the metabolic breakdown pathway that I talked about at the end of last class. And if there's an excess of pyruvate and then by extension acetyl-CoA backed up uh, at, at the entry point into the TCA cycle, rather than getting broken down through that beta oxidation path pathway, the cells can build up fat through fatty acid synthesis to build, bring these together in the form of triglycerides and now you have high circulating free fatty acids that will get stored by adipocytes in the body. Right, so if the no-fat diet is a, is a no-go, uh, what else can you do? How about the no-nothing diet? <laughs> or just starve yourself. This will work, right? Because you haven't put any calories, any carbon sources uh, for the cells to be able to, uh, to metabolize. Um, but what are the immediate consequences of this? And I should say the right-hand side is going to be a little bit of a shorthand for the metabolic pathways as we've introduced them in this class. TCA cycle down at the bottom glycolysis going down the pipe here, gluconeogenesis occurring in the liver, okay. Bu building it way back, and then this um, alternative path here to triglyceride synthesis and breakdown involving uh, glycerol through glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and acetyl-CoA down here at the entry point into the TCA cycle. The first thing that will happen if there's caloric depredation is that blood glucose levels will start to drop. We all know this feeling. This is what happens when we get hungry. Right? Oh, my blood glucose levels are low. It's like, right? What the signals that are coming from, from your body and the, the driving force to maintain that glu that, um, those circulating glucose levels are largely coming from your brain. Your brain is a very glycolytic organ kind of important for it to stay metabolically happy. Um, and this creates a driving force for many of the other hormonal changes that will uh, occur as a result of caloric deprivation. One of the first consequences will be to mobilize um, other sources of nutrients elsewhere in the body if they're available. I said this once in passing, and I'll, I'll say it again now. Recall that for uh, if the, the first response is going to be trying to maintain circulating blood glucose levels in some way, if it's possible, the body will need to mobilize glucose by an alternative means if it's not getting it from the diet. So the fastest and most responsive way for this to occur is through gluconeogenesis in the liver and all these things that we talked about before. And one of those irreversible steps of glycolysis that can't simply be run in, the re in reverse through gluconeogenesis is down at the very bottom end of glycolysis, phosphoenolpyruvate to pyruvate, 
That step is irreversible. That last substrate level phosphorylation can't run that backwards. But what it can go is through this side route involving oxaloacetate. And this is what happens when glucosamogenesis needs to get uh, kicked into gear. The cell's body starts drawing from oxaloacetate stores to be able to maintain blood glucose levels. The secondary consequence of that, however, is that that oxaloacetate is also doubly required for the TCA cycle. So as the body um, steals oxaloacetate from the TCA cycle for gluconeogenesis, you've now depleted the TCA cycle from tricarboxylic acids to be able to run this to run the cycle. The consequence of the oxaloacetate depletion here, so now TCA cycle is not working, you will also break down fats during this caloric depredation process. But what happens is, is that there's no place for the um, acetyl-CoA to go after the fats have been broken down because the oxaloacetate is being depleted to maintain glucose stores. So this is revving up here. This is getting broken down here, but now there's an accumulation of acetyl-CoA that needs to be handled by some other mechanism other than the TCA cycle. These get further metabolized through an alternative pathway, which was this alternative path that was shown in one of the earlier slides from last time, into metabolites called ketones or ketone bodies. To remind a little bit of organic chemistry, ketones are two carbon groups brought together by a carbonyl, carbon double bond, such as shown here. And these ketone bodies, um, in fact, can be metabolized by metabolically active tissues like the brain and like the heart as an alternative energy source. These are also um, the types of compounds, because they're ketones, they're fragrant, we can smell them. You can smell the, these on a person um, if they are um, in a state of ketosis, because they're, they're volatile compounds that will evolve off of smell it on a person's breath. And they've alluded to this to diabetics who are under, in a cellular starvation state. They're forming these keto, ketone bodies, some of which are keto acids. So people have heard of ketoacidosis. It's a re, the result of building up high levels of the ketones in, in the body and as a marker of the cellular starvation uh, response. And so there's a pretty profound shift in metabolic handling that occurs when you start mobilizing these ketone bodies. And it's by this metabolic rewiring that's taking place inside the cell. The final consequence of this, which gets uh, to where um, amino acid metabolism feeds into the metabolic pathways that we've, we've introduced, um, recall that um, amino acids, such as aspartate, are uh, one quick transamination or isomerization away from becoming something in the TCA cycle, such as oxaloacetate. Uh, and this is then a company's breakdown, not just of fats, but muscle. Any of your bigger muscles, they have a lot of protein in them. Those can get broken down into their uh, amino acid subunits, and then they get in to try to maintain the TCA cycle as well. So you will get fat metabolism, but over a prolonged period of time, it's also going to uh, be associated with a ketoacidotic state and muscle wasting to be able to maintain the glucose levels at a high enough level or ketone levels at a high enough level to allow important organs such as your heart and your brain to stay alive. The consequences of the, the, the complete cellular starvation response, part of the motivation for a diet, I don't know, from maybe 20 years ago called the Atkins diet, have people heard of this, where it is eliminating carbohydrates from the diet and then supplementing with protein only. And the rationale for this is to elicit the same type of um, starvation type of response on glucose gluconeogenesis, but then rather than having your muscles get wasted away to provide oxaloacetate, supplement with a protein-rich diet that gives the amino acids that needed to feed in and maintain the TCA 
cycle. Our cartoon on the right then is trying to establish this metabolic state where nutrients are coming in here rather than in here on the top in the form of uh, carbohydrates or from fats over on the right hand side to promote breakdown of fats, glycerol backbone through glycolysis, the fatty acids through beta oxidation, and then the TCA cycle can still work because you're maintaining the um, three car uh, the uh, tricarboxylic acid pool through the protein diet. And so this can work as long as you don't change things. You have to commit to something like this for <laughs> forever. Um, if you go back to what you're usually doing, all this goes right back to the way it once was. For, for all of these, the only thing that's going to change these in the long term are permanent changes. Carbon sources coming in means you know, if that's more than energy utilization, right? that's going to get stored in some way. You can change that a bit with exercise. This creates mo mobilization to break down fast through lip lipolysis. And those will have positive impacts on your respiratory capacity in the mitochondria which then relates to how effectively you're breaking down some of those fat breakdown products. And so your mitochondria can work differently in different metabolic states. If your tissues are uh, more metabolically active, those will help with fat metabolism. And then the final part, which is where we're going to transition over into to alcohol, we're going to talk about how alcohol metabolism feeds directly into some of these pathways and creates a shortcut for fat storage. Oh, and right, I have to tell this in the form of an anecdote. Because if we get to the end of the semester, I start fi telling funny stories about myself. Uh, and so when I started teaching these, these lectures, um, I'm not a metabolism person. So I have to give these some type of real world um, uh, evidence for me to keep my engagement into the material. So when I was first uh, teaching it, I was doing my usual thing. I have two daughters. When they, at this time, they were pretty young. And um, my, my daughter's like, oh, can I have one of these vitamin waters for my lunch? And I was like, no way, those things are full of sugar. You don't want to have one of those things. And then she was old enough at the time to fire back at me. She's like, well, why do you have one at lunch? You have a good point. And I know I have to teach these lectures, so let's do an experiment. Because I know how much one of those vitamin waters is. 125 calories per bottle. I was like, let's do a dietary intervention. So I'm going to go we'll measure me a couple of times. I bounce up and down, bounce up and down on the scale in the morning. And then I'm going to stop with 125 calories every day. And let's see if that moves the needle on my weight. And so she recorded all the numbers for me. I guess, and well, maybe uh, it, it's kind of hard to, hard, hard to see. Maybe it drifts a little bit, right? But there's a lot of ups and downs. It's a lot of back and forth. And then I recognized, and the reason why I put this on the slide, I had two weddings <laughs> that messed up here. And I said, I apparently I like the open bar better than the dance floor, because you can see that kind of offset all the things that I did with my vitamin water. All right, so why might that be? The met metabolic pathways for alcohol metabolism are identical to the processes of fermentation, but run in reverse. Okay, so the way that yeast can make ethanol or champagne and for beer, we have a couple of the enzymes to take them back, and that's how we metabolize them. What occurs? Well, if we ingest ethanol, it is small enough and permeable enough to go all the way through our bodies. It, its metabolic byproduct is to be oxidized into this intermediate called acid aldehyde. Now, I have this note here. This threw me for a second. It, the enzyme that promotes that oxidation is alcohol dehydrogenase. It is a dehydrogenase, and it's catalyzing an oxidation reaction. What I mean by running it in reverse is that this is not the normal way metabolically, for example, that yeast would use that enzyme. They would take these intermediates to make ethanol and, and consume a reducing equivalent in the process. In us, we have alcohol dehydrogenase, and so this is how we're, we're running it when ethanol is in abundance. Secondarily, to get back into metabolic pathways that we're aware of, we have to be able to handle the acid aldehyde intermediate. 
and convert it into something that can be met metabolized by the core metabolic pathways. And that involves another dehydrogenation reaction and oxidation of acid aldehyde to acetyl-CoA. So now we're back into core metabolism. Again. But remember, acetyl-CoA is the breakdown product of beta oxidation from fat. So if there's a lot of ethanol into the system, a couple of dehydrogenation reactions later, now you have a lot of building blocks for fat synthesis and driving fatty acid synthesis um, as a result of this consumption. Another thing, let's see. I see there's a few Asians in the audience. My wife is Asian, she's Shanghainese, and can't drink, can't hold her alcohol. And what does that mean? She gets no enjoyment out of it, and she gets really sick if she does. Um, and this is a direct result of that intermediate acid aldehyde. Acid aldehyde we do not normally make. The only reason that it would arise is by this pathway involving ethanol. And the problem associated with it is this aldehyde group. Aldehydes are chemically reactive. Those chemical reactions can disrupt the um, electron transport chain in the mitochondria, giving rise to free radicals. As a result of this free radical generation, more to come on that, this ties into oxidative stress that can interfere with um, different pathways, which we'll speak more about antioxidants and detoxifying enzymes that would reverse the effect of those uh, free radicals get depleted. And because of the chemical reactivity of the aldehyde, these can form covalent products on proteins, amino acids, lipids, so-called addicts, so chemical, foreign chemical groups on biomolecules. And these can create immune responses, new antigens, neoantigens on certain proteins if it gets uh, bad, bad enough. Um, and if this is somebody who's a chronic drinker, um, if this is occurring over a long period of time in the support cells uh, in the liver, so-called stellate cells, as a result of all of this mitochondrial st stress and metabolic stress, this triggers the secretion of extracellular matrix protein collagen in the liver. And this ties into um, the accumulation of fat and hepatocytes also in the, the immune cells. And so this ECM secretion, this fattening and dying of cells in the liver, this will lead to cir uh, cirrhosis, hardening of the liver, associated with alcoholics, okay? Um, and it's a result of the acid aldehyde byproducts from chronic overconsumption of alcohol. Right, I gotta get back to my wife now. I gotta get into that. That unpleasant feeling if you drink too much, the hangover the day after, okay, that's inflammation related to this guy in the middle. All right, that metabolic by byproduct, acid aldehyde. In the Asian population, there's variations of these two enzymes. One that is deficient in this acid aldehyde dehydrogenase activity, meaning this pathway doesn't work as well as it ordinarily should. And then another allele in the uh, East Asian population that is hyperactive for processing alcohol into acid aldehyde. So I've not genotyped my wife, but I'm pretty sure she has both of these alleles because she basically has one sip turns red, flushing, immediately goes to the acid aldehyde. And if she has two sips, she's done like, in the bathroom. All right. So that's on the caloric consumption. I have one more uh, addition on things. Again, I teach this five or six times. So, like I have to wrink, change in another wrinkle. So my vitamin and water diet didn't move the needle at all with my weight because I have other activities and things like that. So I said, let's try something a little bit more uh, aggressive that ties into some elements of starvation, but not doing the same thing all the time. And so this involves the intermittent fasting diet. More and more people seem to be hearing about this. When I first talked about it, people thought it was bizarre. Um, here's the rationale for this. It's called 5-2. And what that means is you eat whatever you want on five days of the week. Uh, but two, you drop your caloric intake down a third to a third of what you ordinarily eat. So hardly anything. So 
small rations. Why? The rationale for this, we talked about the liver, important um, organ for gluco circulating glucose levels, gluconeogenesis. I also mentioned when we were talking about uh, glycogen storage is an important place for glycogen stores in the liver. So when you don't eat, one of the first things that gets mobilized before gluconeogenesis kicks in is the mobilization of glycogen stores. And depending upon how much you've eaten before you start doing this, that usually takes place at 12 to 16 hours of no eating. So that's going to, after that, you have gluconeogenesis to the extent possible, and then you're going to have the breakdown of fats and that oxaloacetate depletion. That's exactly the same as the um, um, starvation diet that I talked about before. But you don't do it forever. You do it long enough that you go into a state of mild ketosis, so like a gentler, calmer level of those things. And then at the end of that day, you can go back to eating. And, and what ends up happening is those nutrient sources basically replenish everything that you had depleted before. So you kind of empty the tank all in all uh, different points along the metabolic pathways, just enough to try to get as much as you can out from here. And then you replenish with whatever you want to eat after that. I said, this sounds kind of crazy. So I tried. All right, here was my vitamin water range. This is where I started. And so you do this two days a week, and then the other day, five days, you do it whatever you want. Um, so mine are Mondays and Wednesdays. So if I seem a little cranky on Monday office hours, see why. So 600 calories and then keep going there. And then you just kind of balance back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So that sort of worked. My new wrinkle this year is I bought a ketone meter. That mild state of keto acidosis, I mentioned you have this fragrant compound that gets evolved uh, when you go into this state. And you can actually use this for redox chemistry in these little devices. It's basically like a mini breathalyzer. We talked about um, one of the things that can get evolved, the byproduct of one of these, ket uh, these ketones, is acetone. It's from chemistry class, things like that. Well, the acetone, if you breathe it over a fuel cell, which is what's inside this, you can, you can oxidize the uh, acetone associated with a reduction in oxygen over a metal fuel cell that's in here. Gains of electrons, losses of electrons. There's just enough current that goes through that metal catalyst that's in the device here that you can measure it and uh, calibrate it to how much of the substrate that you had breathed in. So I'm going to see how I'm doing. This takes 20 seconds to purge itself. If any of you, usually if you take this, it will read zero. But you're not starving yourself. I should have pressed this before. Okay, so 3.45 millimolar estimated in the blood, which is a ketotic state. Because I've, I've eaten some, but I haven't totally offset. So I did some data collection here. So here's the last, I did a couple of weeks here. And so here are those fluctuations in weight that I talked about before, and that you'll see the ketotic state once it goes away. Then I put on the pounds, then I stop eating, then these go up, around, out in phase, out in phase. So pretty good anti correlation. What it's doing is I'm shifting back and forth between that depleted thing, replenish the stores, go back to normal, up and down, up and down I go. Changes up the week a little bit. All right. We made a brief allusion to um, the impact of alcohol on the mitochondria. It's oxidative stress for your radicals. I want to speak a little bit more um, about this generally in terms of what's called oxidative stress. And this involves a redox chemistry. It involves the back and forth between oxidation pathways, reduction pathways, and the potential escape of electrons 
that are getting transferred back and forth between coenzymes, substrates, products, and metabolic pathways that we've talked about. When those electrons escape from one of those redox pathways, one place where they're apt to go is oxygen or under aerobic conditions. And when that free electron goes on to oxygen, it will generate what's called a reactive oxygen species, or ROS for short, called superoxide. So oxygen plus one free electron, one negative. And superoxide very quickly uh, in aqueous solutions can become peroxide, pick up another electron as follows. And both of those comprise reactive oxygen stress, reactive, uh, comprise a reactive oxygen species inside the cell. There are other reactive species involving free radicals, namely those involving nitrogen. Go all the way back to Professor Barker's lecture on second messenger signaling, guanylate cyclase, protein kinase G, these things. Nitric oxide is an intermediate. It's a free radical also. It is an unpaired electron. It can um, uh, perform chemistry inside the cells, and it can also perform uh, react with reactive oxygen species to form super reactive uh, nitrogen species called peroxynitrate. So all of these free radical products have the potential to do the chemistries that I'll touch on in the next couple of slides. For Ross, the upshot is that the major source of reactive oxygen species in the cells occurring all the time is through the electron transport chain, through aerobic metabolism involving complexes one, two, three, four. I'm showing this slide again because I'm going to reframe it in a different way. When I talked about this, when we were discussing electron transport, it's described as like this great handoff electron goes to the next uh, iron sulfur cluster and then it gets passed off to the next com uh, complex in the respiratory chain. And that's true for the most part, but in reality, they, it's not 100% efficient at the transfer of, uh, of those electrons. Electrons can leak out of the electron transport chain and then give rise to this reactive oxygen species. We're reminding that oxygen is right in the vicinity here is the terminal electron acceptor of aerobic uh, uh, respiration. We're going to speak just briefly about the major place where a leak occurs of electrons, and it's at the first handoff from NADH to complex one. When I talked about complex one, I mentioned that the first electron acceptor was a coenzyme called flavin mononucleotide, or FMN. Here's what it looks like. It ordinarily will pick up the two electrons from NADH and go into its reduced form, as shown here. But occasionally, one of those electrons falls off and then is out free to react with oxygen and to form a reactive oxygen species. There are also certain circumstances of metabolic states that may uh, promote the leakiness of the handoff to, to complex one and give rise to more reactive oxygen species inside cells. And for completeness, the same thing can happen with the, the next handoff to complex three. But what happens with, with superoxide? Why do we consider it a stress? Um, what are the different things that it can do? The free radical, the free electron, is highly chemically reactive. One example that it could, uh, that, uh, of what it can do is immediately modify the side groups of multiple amino acids. Here's one example for, for arginine, where you have what's called a carbonylation. The oxygen here will attack at the carbon here and release this entire nitrogen group and create this carbonylated product at the end. I will note that this carb carbonylated product on the end here has another free, is another free aldehyde. So that's, again, reactive, which can cross-link to different amines and do other types of chemistry. And so there's a lot of uh, this propagating chemical reactions that occur as a result of free radicals. One place in particular where that cascading reactions can be bad are in lipids. 
recall when you did cell membranes, Professor Barker, you know, um, unsaturated and saturated fatty acids. The unsaturated fatty acids that have the double bonds. If an electron comes in and breaks apart that uh, double bond, it generates yet another free radical that can propagate through the membrane. And so it does chemistry, generates another reactive species that can go in and uh, do another chemical modification nearby. And then the last thing to say about reactive oxygen species is that these can cause DNA damage. And that these uh, free radicals will modify covalently bases in DNA. They are repaired by the nucleotide excision repair machinery that we talked about in a couple of other settings. The complexity with ROS-induced DNA damage is that it's a, not a nice, clean uh, modification like alkylation, if you will, or thionine dimers with, with UV. It elicits a whole array of different um, base pair damages, so it needs to have a lot more different types of recognition and repair machineries to offset all of the different uh, lesions that are caused by it. So it would seem to be very bad for the cell, right? How would anything operate in the face of this chronic generation of reactive oxygen species in cells? We've been intimately tied to aerobic metabolism for a long time. And as a result of that close connection with respiration and eukaryotic life in general, we have co-evolved a rather elaborate um, detoxifying uh, set of pathways and machinery, enzymatic machinery, to handle reactive oxygen species when they're being produced in the cells. Most broadly, they fall into this category of what are called scavenging enzymes, which catalyze reactions that uh, provide sacrificial substrates that can be modified with the reactive oxygen species as they're generated. And so those sacrificial substrates, pick one for the team, so to speak. Rather, you'd rather have one of those be damaged or one of those be oxidized rather than a base of your DNA or a key protein on the uh, membrane surface. And one of the major um, sacrificial biomolecules is called glutathione, or GSH for short. And where the SH comes in relates to a free thiol in the glutathione molecule that acts as an electronic acceptor um, uh, during these, sca these scavenging processes. So acting as an antioxidant. So let's just walk through the, the, the path here. If we have oxygen, free electron escape, let's say, from flavin mononucleotide. Now we have superoxide in water. These can also give rise to hydrogen peroxide. One of the first set of scavenging enzymes is to actually promote the formation of hydrogen peroxide as a somewhat less reactive reactive oxygen species. And that's catalyzed by an enzyme called superoxide dismutase, or SOD. Um, what these are seeking to do is create hydrogen peroxide, which can be handled by another enzyme called the catalase, to generate oxygen and water. The other way in which these hydrogen peroxides can be handled is with the glu glutathione machinery where instead of going and making water and oxygen, two free glutathiones here, this is what glutathione looks like, here is the free sulfahydryl group, the free thiol group, that gets oxidized to form a disulfide bond, also generating water. And so depending upon um, the localization of the reactive oxygen species and the relative abundance of these scavenging enzymes, you can favor this process uh, or this process. It's also critically dependent upon overall glutathione levels in cells, how useful that is in the substrate. Um, as I was mentioning for the alcohol consumption, if you have too many free radicals, you can deplete glutathione levels, preventing this pathway from happening, and then you're relying on this one. The handling of oxidative stress and the study of oxidative stress, heaven forbid we should ever give you an opinion paper on oxidative stress. It, it's, it's a real um, disaster to study. Uh, and the reason why is because of the reactivity of the molecule 
and also its ubiquity. It's always being generated inside the cell. It has real pleiotropic effects on a number of different biomolecules. I already mentioned the secondary consequences of what happens when it's synthesized. And then you're always, the cell is always having these scavenging processes trying to offset the oxidative stress as it's being produced. And it goes on and on and on down the pathway. There are a lot of other complications from a scientific perspective to be able to study it in a rigorous way. The localization of the reactive oxygen species matters if it's right at the mitochondria or is it reactive oxygen species can be generated at the plasma membrane. These can mean different things. They're short-lived species, and so the range of action that they operate on, those carbonylation processes or peroxidation processes happen locally as soon as they're produced. There's a bunch of other complications to try to study them, so it's challenging. This closes metabolism. I'll highlight two investigators uh, here at UVA. Thurls, our lipid uh, signaling guy, interested in insulin handling. We heard about insulin in an earlier lecture in, uh, in the Department of Pharmacology. And then Zen um, in the Cardiovascular Research Center, very interested in muscle metabolism, mitochondria, the effect of exercise, and so forth. So you can look them up.